Okay, I have that it's 5.30, so I would like to convene this October 7 uh, meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Holly, would you take roll, please? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Muted, Lois. Now it says it's muted. You're fine. We hear you. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Director Ackman. <laughs> I don't here. know if I'm muted or unmuted. I'm here. Director Fulce. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Uh, staff has none. Okay. Um, Let's see, this is the time when we have oral communications uh, regarding items on the closed session. And I don't see any um, attendees, just us panelists. So I would assume that means that we don't have anybody to make any comments. Um, with that, uh, we will go ahead and adjourn to closed session. See you back in a minute or two. Thank you. Okay, I have 6.30, so I would like to convene this open session of the October 7, 2021 meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley uh, Water District. Um, there are no actions to report out of uh, closed session, so can we now take the roll call for the open session? President Mayhood? Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Fulce. Here. And Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has none. Okay. Um, this is the part of the meeting where we have oral communications from the public about um, items that are not on the agenda, but are part of the purview of the district. And I see that we have uh, four members of the public uh, in attendance. Is there anybody that would like to make an oral communication at this time? If so, please press raise your hand. I don't see anybody wanting to make um, a comment at this point. So um, that means I'll go on to director's reports. I have two things to report as president. The first is that um, with regard to negotiations with employees about uh, salaries and benefits, no parties have given notice um, to open the existing um, employment MOUs for negotiation. So that means that the existing uh, agreements will continue in effect until next year. The second thing I'd like to announce is that at its meeting on September 23, the Santa Margarita Groundwater um, Association, kind of a landmark event. It was the public hearing on the draft um, GSP, Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Um, there were only a few comments from the public either uh, received in writing or for that matter at the meeting, but frankly that's not terribly surprising given the thing is a behemoth. It was over 600 pages, so I'm not sure a lot of people were up for reading a document of that size. Um, we did have a couple of more substantive comments 
um, by representatives of the National Marine Fisheries Service and the California Division of Fish and Wildlife. But um, this is kind of typical. They're apparently doing this for every single GSP um, that goes forward to the state. Um, and the state is sort of used to this, um, these kinds of comments. So the next uh, event will be that the Santa Margarita uh, will be meeting uh, on November 17th to consider the revised GSP, that is revised based on the comments that we did receive. Um, and that would be the final uh, adoption, at which point uh, it would then be submitted uh, to the state by the January 2022 deadline. Okay. Um, with that, are there any quick comments or questions about any of that from members of the board? If not, I'll um, go ahead and go to our first and only item of old business, the new Brown Act requirements for remote meetings under AB 361. Rick? Right, and uh, District Council is here to present this item to the board and the public. Jan? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair Mayhood, um, District Manager Rogers. Uh, this is old business because it's coming before the board now um, a second time. At the last meeting, we had discussed um, legislation that looked like it was going to take effect with respect to continuing to conduct remote meetings uh, in, con uh, in compliance with the Brown Act. There were still at that time governor's executive orders that were allowing remote meetings to take place. Um, since that last discussion, AB 361, which is legislation that was enacted this year and signed into law in September by the governor has taken effect. And the governor has rescinded executive orders that had suspended Brown Act provisions allowing remote meetings and the net effect of all that is that remote meetings now can only be conducted in compliance with um, the Brown Act as amended by AB 361. So the purpose of this item is to consider um, whether the district wants to continue conducting remote meetings in compliance with the provisions of AB 361 that, that allow the district to continue doing that. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll skip to uh, forward in the memo to the discussion of what the requirements were under the Brown Act prior to the pandemic for remote meetings. Um, as you know, um, before the pandemic and before the governor suspended certain parts of the Brown Act due to a con conditions of emergency, um, meetings could only be conducted remotely where a quorum of the board, at least a quorum of the board or a majority, and this applies to committees as well, were physically present together at a location um, within the boundaries of the district, um, pursuant to a, to a properly noticed and agendized meeting. And if any member of the board or committee needed or to, to participate in the, the uh, meeting remotely, um, that could be done as long as it was a minority of you know one or two members. Um, and they had to post the agenda at the location from which they'd be attending remotely. Um, and that location had to be identified in the agenda. Um, and that location has to be, had to be open to the public during the, the remote meeting. So that essentially means if somebody's traveling to a hotel room, they've got to post the agenda at the hotel room and have it open to the public during the meeting. Um, we haven't had to do that during the pandemic due to the governor's executive orders. And now the district has the ability to continue conducting remote meetings during the state of emergency under AB 361. And the, the key to AB 361 is that a few specific findings have to be made uh, in order to continue to conduct remote meetings. And those findings are that a proclaimed state of emergency is in effect. Uh, that state or local officials have imposed or recommended measures to promote social distancing. And as a result of the emergency meeting in person would present imminent risks to the health, health or safety of attendees. Um, and as long as those findings can be made and are made by the district every 30 days, then the district can continue to conduct remote meetings the same way we, we have been doing during the pandemic. Um, 
So what you have in front of you is a resolution that if adopted would allow the district to take advantage of um, these remote meeting provisions of AB 361. It contains the necessary findings that I just described and it's written, make it clear that it applies to the board and all of the, the, the district's committees. So the district's committees can simply rely on this resolution rather than taking their own action pursuant to AB 361. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, shall we just kind of go through the board as we normally do? Jamie, would you like to start if you have if you have any questions? Sure, um, I do. Uh, Gina, are, are you familiar with AB 339? Um, uh, I, I understand it was a bill that um, would have allowed uh, the public to be able to continue to participate um, remotely uh, after the pandemic um, and not be required to be be present in person in order to participate in public meetings. Are you familiar with that bill? Um, I did follow it and I had I had written something up about it once or twice. I don't remember the specifics off the top of my head. Um, so I could I could pull it up quickly if it's something you want to uh, discuss. Well, <clears throat> I just I think that it's a, you know an important one to follow in the sense that while um, I think that you know we are still looking at how we go back to having our own in person meetings as a board, you know we we want to be able to um, allow people to continue to participate remotely um, if if they would like to do so. And um, so I think, you know, I, I think that tonight um, Governor Newsom vetoed that bill. And so if he did, that's a pretty clear message that the state of California is sending everybody back to the boardroom. Um, but I would be interested to see what um, you think after you've had a chance to follow up uh, with where that bill is right now. I'm checking as we speak. All right. Well, we'll go to Bob and we'll get back to you, Gina, and give you a chance to check. Okay. Well, actually, my my question might be for Gina as well, so I'm not okay. sure if I'm going to interrupt her search. Um, it, is there any sort of um, objective criteria regarding what constitutes an emergency? In, in other words, is there at some point where we, we, we can't pass the red face test anymore? Um, and we really do have to go back to um, uh, in-person board meetings. E even if we were to continue declaring this uh, exemption, I, I think every month, right, um, going forward. Right, yeah, there, there are objective criteria built into the law, the main one being um, a reference to government code section 8558, which defines... Um, a declared state of emergency for purposes of the law. And I think to, to, to make it simple for our purposes, um, the governor currently has a pro proclaimed state of emergency under that code section that we, we can and do rely on in connection with the resolution. But at some point, the governor will, um, will retract that proclamation. And when that happens, and, and by the way, we don't know how much lead time we'll get when that occurs. Um, he may signal that he's going to do it months in advance or he might not. Um, but once that's done, uh, it's unlikely that the district would continue to have a basis to uh, to readopt the resolution to conduct remote meetings. Okay. So um, I, I know that we have underway um, activities to create a hybrid uh, situation where um, the board may be physically present, but the attendees could be participating remotely, which is something I've been in favor of a long, long time. So um, I think this gives us, it sounds like this gives us a little bit of headroom to get that prepared um, and get, get that ready to go and test it out and debugged and all that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this state of emergency will last at least a couple more months. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lois, did you have anything? Yes. I, I really like the idea of in-person meetings. On the other hand, 
uh, we don't have a big space. And when I talk in person, I'm talking about having the public there also. And we don't, we don't have a big enough space. It, it used to be that we would, we would get the room full. And I liked in-person meetings because you could go out and meet the public that as a board member, maybe you don't know their name or whatever. You can, you can shake their hand and ask their name and say you're happy to see them and, and whatever. But it seems like our room is a little small for that. And I, um, I, I agree with doing um, meetings on this emergency basis that it's too dangerous right now uh, for us to have in-person meetings. That's all. Okay. I, I think, um, Lois, I think the good thing is that Rick has been working with the admin committee um, to think about alternative spaces and perhaps we've identified one that will be bigger so that we can have meetings that also involve, um, you know, sort of social distancing. But I think that, as Bob says, the hybrid model is the one that we're, we're, we're going to all end up going to, I think, eventually. Rick, you want to expand on that? You know, just a little, because it's not the item, but we will be going to the admin committee uh, the next meeting. The agenda comes out tomorrow, has some information in it. But then once the admin committee has a chance to discuss, depending on the outcome, we will be bringing this to the full board. Because staff knows that even so, we do not have to have in-house meetings. There will be times uh, during this emergency we may want to have in-house meetings. A certain subjects come up that we may, you know, want to have presentations and so forth that with posters and so forth that, that, that do not come across, you know, the Zoom uh, as well. So we, we want to move in with an option much sooner than later. And plus, you know, with the way the governor has moved on this stuff, you know, he hasn't given us a lot of notice. So we're going to move ahead and hopefully in the next month to two months, we can come to the full board with some recommendations and then have the full board discuss and give staff final direction. Okay. Uh, Mark, did you have anything you wanted to ask? No, I have no questions. Okay. Um, I don't either. So as I understand it, we have a, a suggested resolution in front of us. And I think the idea is that that resolution um, will make us in um, compliance with the law and that as Bob mentioned it has to be renewed every 30 days which we would am I correct Gina that we would probably do that on the consent agenda so that we don't have to recapitulate this every time well I, I considered that in light of a prior discussion um, but I don't think it's going to be practical because of the specific findings that need to be made um, all right. I, but I think it can be done very um, uh, succinctly <laughs> as a recurring item of business with a very simple presentation that confirms right. that those conditions are still in effect. Um, and just if I could quickly, while I have the floor, respond sure. to Director Ackman's um, question. I, I quickly refreshed my recollection about AB 339. And it's, it was one of the package of Brown Act bills that was going through the legislature this year. And, and it was particularly focused on, or it, toward the end, it went through a lot of changes, but toward the end, it was focused on city and county governments with more than 250,000 residents. And for them, it made it a requirement to give the public an option to attend meetings remotely um, during a state of emergency. Uh, but the, its final version didn't end up really having any impact on um, on special districts like SLV, um, and the action really ended up being all in, in, in AB 361 that we're now figuring out how to implement. Um, 
And uh, the last comment that I want to make is something we'll, we'll have to talk about is whether we can really do the reapproval of the resolution or readoption once a month, or if we're going to have to just do it every board meeting to avoid any lapse with the 30 days. Well, we'll, we'll do whatever we need to do <laughs> on, that, on that regard. Is there anybody that would like to make a motion in this regard? Uh, I would. Okay, Lois. I'll make a motion that we declare a state of emergency and uh, on the ongoing uh, emergency and authorizing remote meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. I'll second that. And also we're gonna go to the public too. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now we have a, a motion on the floor and um, I will go ahead and thank you, Bob, for reminding me. Um, let's go ahead and see if we have any comments um, from members of the public on this topic before we bring it back to the board for a vote. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. I hope that is working. <laughs> um, but if, if somebody there, if, if it's not working, send me a... a message or somebody or send Holly a message and let us know if it's not working. Um, okay, um, with that, let's go ahead and Holly, you wanna go ahead and take a roll call vote? Okay, um, I believe there was a motion in the recommendation. Is that what we wanna go with? Yeah, so um, we're basically, um, it, we're adopting the resolution um, right. that is on, is as attachment A. I, I so tried to read what was on here. Yeah, that's, that's under the recommendation. What, yeah, that we're adopting the attached resolution um, so that we can continue the three okay. months pursuant to AB 361. Okay, I was just There's making no sure. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fulz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Um, with that, we'll go on to items of new business. The first one being the consolidation of Forest Springs and Brackenbrae Mutuals into the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, go ahead, Rick. Um, thank you. Um, Forest Springs with approximately 128 connections in Brackenbrae Mutual with approximately 24 connections are located um, up off a of big basin, um, a highway uh, about three miles uh, outside of downtown Boulder Creek. Um, their service areas uh, are continuous or, or are adjoining or adjacent to our uh, service areas. They're very close in proximity with the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Both Forest Springs and Brack and Bray were severely impacted by uh, the CZU fire with damage to their distribution system and water storage. Um, in addition, their water supplier, which is uh, currently Big Basin Water, was also severely impacted uh, by fire, by the fire and, and drought conditions. Um, you know, both Forest Springs and Brack and Bray Mutual purchased their water through master meters uh, with uh, uh, from Big Basin. Um, Forest Springs and Bracken Bay have contacted the district to explore um, the possibility of consolidation um, into San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Both uh, already are located uh, in our sphere of influence. Um, um, so it, it makes uh, this consideration, you know, a fairly easy uh, to, to overcome. Considerable distribution upgrades would be needed um, for this consolidation. There would be approximately 3,870 lineal feet of existing undersized San Lorenzo Valley distribution system that would need to be upgraded. Um, construction of approximately 2,090 lineal feet uh, in the Bracken Bray community. Construction of 3,000 lineal feet uh, to provide uh, interconnection uh, to Forest Springs. There would also be the need of a, a pump station 
as Forest Springs and uh, Brackenbrae higher reaches of their distribution system is higher than our, our, our water uh, pressure zone in that location. Consolidation costs are, you know, are not cheap. We estimated these costs via project and, and estimated at $4.29 million. Both mutuals are looking at substantial individual costs to rebuild uh, their water distribution and storage systems. Um, San Lorenzo Valley, uh, we have been talking with both Forest Springs and uh, Brackenbrae, and they're moving ahead uh, through uh, a pretty painful uh, funding and engineering to rebuild their water system. Basically, they lost their storage, they lost a lot of mainline, and what didn't get damaged in the fire, a lot of facilities were damaged by the cleanup uh, when the large trucks and equipment came in for tree removal uh, and debris removal to many homes that burnt like up in, in the Forest uh, Springs area. Uh, both uh, mutuals are would be responsible to upgrade their individual systems, uh, uh, you know, services, um, fire hydrants, et cetera. Uh, the Department of Water Resources um, Regional uh, Assistance Small Community Drought Relief Grant Program provides for grant funding for, for small community water systems such as Brackenbrae and, and uh, Forest Springs. Uh, the state's approved approximately $200 million for small community programs uh, in response to, to the drought and for consolidation. On September 20th, uh, 2021, the district submitted a grant application to the Department of Water Resources for improving uh, needed, uh, for improvements needed to consolidate both the small mutuals into the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, a lot of that background, that grant application mapping and uh, a lot of the details are, are with this item. Uh, it's anticipated to take approximately two months for review from the Department of, Department of Water Resources. Um, this grant came down, the district was contacted and basically it's a first come first serve grant. We needed to move um, and get our application in uh, so we could you know, get closer to hopefully getting uh, it first in line um, to get this grant. We've also solicited the support from uh, Supervisor McPherson, State Senator uh, Stone, and Assemblyman Laird. The consolidation would not go through without the district receiving this grant. The, the, the two small mutuals and the district could not afford to move ahead with this project. And plus Forest Springs and Brackenbrae also need to uh, spend a considerable amount of funds um, in, their, uh, in their own systems. Uh, Brackenbrae uh, is working with FEMA. It's my understanding that Forest Springs was not able to obtain FEMA grant money at this time. So they're looking at um, some substantial costs uh, throughout their, their communities. So if the grant doesn't go through, most likely the consolidation wouldn't go through. You know, we're still moving ahead on, on um, exploring this. What would happen moving forward? Um, uh, this uh, resolution tonight would not be committing uh, uh, a consolidation. It would be to, for the district to administer the grant um, funds and apply for the grant. So, you know, moving forward, we applied for the grant. What would happen if we, we get notified at the end of October that we receive grant funding? Uh, the state assures us that they will give us a basic warrant to move ahead um, with uh, CEQA, with engineering, or with plans and specifications immediately. They want this money spent um, as soon as possible. We committed to a, 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 a approximately a two-year construction uh, project to get this up and running. There's still a lot more work to do. You know, Forest Springs and um, Brackenbrae have asked us to explore and not have committed yet to the consolidation. There's still a lot of details to be worked out. Um, you know, I haven't spent any staff time other than meeting with the two. Mutuals, uh, we've attained a lot of paperwork, but we haven't had any legal. 
uh, expense or any other expense looking at further into what it would be to consolidate. Um, there's still a lot more to be done. However, this process, because they're in our district already, there's no annexation, could move very quickly. But the two sides or the three sides, you know, have to hammer out a lot of details moving forward. Um, so with that, um, I guess I could obtain questions. I, I went through it pretty quick. Um, I, I think the key to take away from, uh, from tonight, this item, is that we're still moving forward and exploring. We're applying for a grant, um, but we have not finalized consolidation. And with that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Okay, so just, just let me clarify one thing before we open this up. So in other words, what we're doing at this point is that we're approving the submittal of the grant application, but we are not committing to moving forward, even if, so I guess my question is, is if, uh, if the grant comes in, are we obligated to move forward on this? I don't believe we're, we're obligated at this time. Okay. Um, that if, if we get approval of the grant, then we will be sitting down with the two mutuals. And very shortly after that, we'll have to come back to the board, get the board to, uh, to approve uh, and buy off on moving forward and to get the two uh, mutuals. We don't want to expense any funds from the grant until we have full commitment. Otherwise, we'd have to probably uh, reimburse the state of any money spent if the uh, consolidation didn't go through. Okay, so as I understand it, then the, the grant is a, a necessary, but it is not a sufficient thing to move Perfect. forward. And uh, so even if the grant happens, we will come back and discuss this at length further. You know, there's a, a lot of discussion that will have to be done uh, with the two mutuals and the district. Now, the grant is a $4.29 million. Uh, it's, a, it's a substantial amount of funds, um, but there is still a lot of you know, paperwork, so to speak, on, you know, we need properties. Yeah. We need a lot of uh, uh, engineering to be done. Um, and we need, you know, some community outreach, out outreach to, the, uh, to, the two, uh, to the two mutuals to make sure that they've got all the information to take back for the final, you know, sale of consolidation. Uh, to their uh, to their constituents. Okay. Well, with that clarification, I'll go ahead and um, get questions from the rest of the board. Bob, would you like to start? Uh, yes. Thanks. Um, I mean, my first reaction to this is: look, if the grant goes through, we may not be legally obligated, but relative to community relations and um, the reality of the situation, we would be committed at some level. Um, and this is one of the things that I think makes me a little bit um, concerned because I think the policy that we should have around consolidations in light of our history with them um, is that those consolidations have to bring to the district a system that is up to SLV WD standards. Um, it, and unless there is an agreement on the part of the district and the board that that not be the case. Um, so I think we as a board need to recognize that while we may have this legal loophole that we could get out, um, at this point, I, I consider ourselves morally committed to um, moving forward this consolidation if we get, if we get the grant. Um, and, and I think we need to go into this um, with that thought in mind. Um, I did a quick back of the envelope uh, calculation and for the districts to do this uh, upgrade on their own without this grant would be $2,000 per household per month for 30 years. It's a, um, it's a excuse me, $2,000 yeah, a month for 30 years. It is an enormous lift. There's, there's just no way anybody could, could do that. Um, I need to check, double check my numbers again now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, sorry, 2,000 a year for 30 years per household. That, that's an enormous number. Um, and I, I just don't think that, uh, that that's something that anybody can carry. In addition to that, the more time that goes by, 
um, the more costs are going to go up. So in between now and when the grant is approved, I would strongly encourage the board to ask the district manager to continue negotiations on what a consolidation would look like. We do not want to have a situation where we get money, but it takes so long for it to happen, for the construction to happen, that like with Long Pico, the costs skyrocket and we end up being short of funds. Um, uh, I did have a couple of technical questions, Rick. Uh, how many tanks would be involved here? We're not there yet. We're looking at, with just some conversations, anywhere from uh, 120 to 240, 250-ish total gallons of storage. You know, it just depends how this engineers out and where we put storage. You know, we want to have adequate fire flow for the zones, which would be, you know, a, we would try to make it one zone. You know, there's some benefit from doing these both at the same time one pump station, you know, probably at least two tanks, you know, um, and there's going to be some selling of the tank locations and a lot of this information because one of the, one of the big sellings of, of the consolidation is we will have large size mains, you know, eight inch mains, and we will have fire flow storage in their community, you know, not in Boulder Creek somewhere, but up in Forest Springs in the Brackenbury area. So we're not, we haven't got to that determination yet, Bob, um, but I would say at least a minimum of two. Okay, well, I appreciate that because that adds to the number of tanks also that we need to maintain long-term. Um, finally, I, I do want to say, you know, the policy that I support on these kinds of consolidations is exactly what's been happening here with Forest Springs and Bracken Bray. They come to us um, and ask us if we would consider um, going forward with this. I, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, we're, we want to be supportive of our neighbors. We were supportive in the recovery after the fire. Um, I very much would like to see uh, these communities join our district um, and to do so in the right way. Uh, so I really applaud everybody's efforts in this area. Um, I, my only caution here is I, I really think the board needs to, uh, if, if this isn't applied, give direction to the district manager to move forward with those negotiations as if the grant were, uh, were received as quickly as possible. So we have no delay between getting the money and being able to start construction. Lois, would you like to make any comments? Sure. <laughs> uh, well, it seems the way the world works. SLV winds up uh, paying uh, money that they thought they would get from those that are wanting to merge with them. And there's no guarantee. I don't think there's a guarantee that that couldn't happen. But on the other hand is... Uh, it's going to replace over 3,870 linear feet of existing undersized water uh, main in the San Lorenzo Valley Water District so that 4.29 uh, or whatever the million was uh, in a way benefits SLV quite a bit. Um, I'm for supporting our neighbors. I think we need to do this. Um, and I have yet to see any consolidation that's been perfect. Felton wound up costing the district some money. And I, I don't know the history on all the other places that have uh, merged with SLV. I'm sure there must be others. But we need to be careful. Uh, we need to let Rick, who I believe knows what he's doing, um, work this out with them and come back to us with a plan. And the bottom line, I think this is something we need to do. Okay. Uh, Mark? Yes, I have... Uh... 
one basic comment and then uh, several technical questions. Um, to Bob's point of giving direction to, uh, to uh, Rick Rogers, I agree that if the board approves this um, this evening, that we should uh, direct uh, Mr. Rogers to move ahead as quickly as possible to develop some kind of memorandums of understanding between with both Bracken Bray and Forest Springs as an outcome of this meeting this evening. Um, starting that now, rather than waiting for the state to come back at the end of the month with an answer is something we should be actively engaged on. Uh, my technical questions, uh, Rick, given all I've heard about water supplies in the area, and the fact that we're now working off of wells uh, from Felton to provide uh, Boulder Creek and surface water supplies not being available now, do we have sufficient water capacity available to be able to take on another? I realize these are small, but do we have that sufficient water capacity without significantly drawing down you know, I, I believe we do, and that will be most likely flushed out in the CEQA process. I'm not concerned. You know, Forest Springs has what is a supplemental connection with us that they're already somewhat figured in to uh, the San Lorenzo Valley's water supply as a, a, a connection. It's not a full mm -hmm. connection, but it's a considerable amount of, of water. That'll be looked at, you know, um, you know, in talking with Bracken Bray, you know, we can pull that water from other areas of the system and they're going to let their service or their spring source go back, you know, to uh, Boulder Creek. Uh, so it'd be a trade off there from other sources. Um, you know, I, I believe uh, uh, we do have sufficient water and that will um, come out through the secret process. Okay. Um, given all of the other work that the district is currently doing, uh, in particular for uh, CZU fire recovery efforts, um, we're now going to take on another significant, potentially, if we approve on this, if we get the grant, take on another significant construction project. Um, between you and the district engineer, how do you continue to stretch um, yourselves and the rest of the staff in order to be able to help our neighbors out? Well, you know, the staff that predominantly will be working in this will be myself, Josh, the director of operations, and our environmental planner. Um, and it's not their first rodeo, so to speak. Agreed. Um, James operated Lumpico probably six, eight months before we even took it over. There's Obviously, it's a low, but I don't know. It's like the gun smoke I saw the other night. The lady had 10 kids. She adopted one more. What's one more? <laughs> so so I, I, I think we'll make it work. We'll make okay. it work. I, I, I'm particularly concerned during the construction process because I think that's the, the, the most intensive short duration period. Um, how can you get either, either supplemental resources if necessary or go back to Rack and Bray, Four Springs, can they provide any of the support that, that I see being necessary for this? Yeah, great questions, Mark. You know, I, I think the workload is going to be putting together the agreement with Brack and Bray and Four Springs. You know, they have mm -hmm. communities concerned. They wanna know, you know, what is gonna take in the way of easements and, and what are they agreeing to? You know, these small mutuals, they have a considerable amount of pride of ownership and they like to be self-sufficient. You know, they're a little cautious of San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And that's fine, which, it, you know, I understand that because every, every consolidation we have done, we have, have overcome that. And there has been a lot of questions. You know, you, oh, you want our water, you want this, you know. So the climb, is going to be to put all this together. The construction, uh, we may be able to piggyback this off of our 236 project. 
and the, the same inspectors and the same bidding process and so forth. Because we're getting ready to do a project, um, go to bid uh, probably spring of next year to do from uh, half of Highway 236. So we're in that area. We've already got a lot of survey work done. Um, and we'll have, a, it'll all be outside contract for construction inspection, which is in the grant funding. Uh, bid design and design and bidding are, are all part of the grant funding. They will all be outside consultants. Yes, Josh will have to put together the RFPs, so forth. But, you know, that's, when you get into that end of the, of the project, you can take a deep breath. And then working up in the communities will be a challenge because it's the narrow roads. Again, you're placing meters. There's a lot of rebuildings uh, going on up in uh, uh, both of the communities. Um, so uh, it'll be a project, there's no doubt, but we'll make it work. We're definitely, you know, we're definitely getting to, uh, you know, we can't take much more on. But like I've always said, there's no such thing as a good time. You, we just have to move ahead and get it done. Um, I would, I would encourage you, if necessary, to consider outside engineering resources to supplement construction, your internal construction management staff. Um, and that I feel should have been part of this grant application also. Given everything else we're doing, I'm concerned with the workload aspects of this, but enough on that. Um, costs. Um, I, I saw that you don't have contingency on the construction costs aspects in this grant application. Um, but it's simply on the um, the soft cost, the engineering, the permitting, but it's not on the actual construction. Um, why not on that? And then related to that, who pays for any cost overruns if that happens during this process? A couple of things. One, uh, there has been a contingency. I met with uh, the State Department of Water Resources. They questioned some of our, our prices. They thought maybe our pipeline prices might have been a little too high per foot mm -hmm. and other that and other contingencies were a bit too low. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of went with higher prices on the pipe to cover just from our past projects. Uh, and I cut back a little bit on contingencies, pretty straightforward projects, but we massage those numbers a little bit uh, once they receive the application. And one of the, uh, what's going to have to be worked out with uh, Brackenbrae, Forest Springs, and the district, what are we going to do if there's price, you know, overruns? You know, basically, um, you know, in general conversation with them, overruns or costs in their communities would have to be uh, uh, burdened by those communities. Uh, and the same, uh, you know, we would look at our, if the pipeline in our district uh, came in higher or there was a reason, uh, we would look at that and have to make some decisions who was going to pay for that. Because we are getting a one point, what, $1.7 million benefit uh, in our system. But, but I don't understand how we as a district apply for this application. If the state gives us the grant, if there are cost overruns, how do you go back to Brack and Bray property owners to say, oh, the pipeline in your area costs more. We need another 100,000 from, from the individuals there. Well, if it's, a, if it's a cost overrun in what we have proposed, right. um, we can go back to the state. But now we have to, we're adding something on, like say, you know, we want more fire hydrants. Those type of things will have to be by the individual uh, mutuals. Right, right. If that is out of scope items that you're not presently uh, planning for. No, I'm thinking about the unknowns that the contractor is going to occur. It's going to happen and change orders from them that. Okay. If, you, the state. if the state uh, realized this is cost estimate from us at this point, and this is early on in the process, then okay. Right, and because I brought that up when she said that she thought our price per foot on pipe was a little steep in the state highway, 
And I said, you know, it's going to be expensive. And she said, well, if you go over, you can, you know, you can come back as long as you don't leave the scope of work that's been approved. So you, you mentioned something about having discussions with them and you massaged some of these costs. The overall bottom line number, are we still at that 4.29 then? I think we're a little higher. And they're mostly, oh, okay. kind of, I think we're a little higher. She did not resubmit that back to me because she wanted to right. get into uh, their okay. estimators. Okay. So, uh, you know, and it was on the admin side. Uh, okay. If they're willing to do that, then. It wasn't millions, but they did increase some percentages. Okay. If they're willing to do that, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, okay. Um, that's all of the questions I have at this point. Thanks. Okay. Jamie? Um, I don't want to belabor the conversation because I am largely in agreement with the concerns that have been raised. Um, but I, I, I did want to understand um, the upgrades that are identified um, as part of the grant application. Can you give me a sense, Rick, what percentage of their total um, infrastructure do those upgrades represent? Well, uh, you know, their systems, I can't speak to that because I haven't spent any time uh, up in Brackenbrae and, and, and Forest Springs. Um, but I do know that, and I don't want to put them uh, uh, on the spot, I do know Mike Judd from uh, Forest Springs and Nicole uh, Launder are on the call tonight. They may want to uh, uh, speak, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't have those. Uh, no, I can get those, Jamie, uh, for you to let you know, but I don't have that right now in front of me. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I obviously um, believe that we need to uh, support our community members, but I just want to kind of understand as we're, as we're looking at bringing new connections into the system and making these upgrades, like how, how, uh, how, how much additional work may need to be done in other parts of the system that aren't touched by, by, you know, the, the projects represented on this grant application long-term that we would need to consider as we look at, you know, what are our, um, the, the costs that we may be, you know, incurring long-term as we absorb these new connections. It's, you know, I'm sure those are all things that you're um, going to continue having discussions with them about as, as we proceed. And, and that goes to, to Bob's statement that, you know, before we agree on the final consolidation, we have to be sure that we're comfortable with the work that was done in Forest Springs and in Brackenbrae. You know, obviously we don't want to take on a lot of their system to replace, you know, because what will happen as soon as we, I mean, the consolidation goes through, the regulatory agencies will come down very hard on SLV and they'll do an inspection and they will request and, 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 and want the district to do a lot of different upgrades. And we want to be sure that you know, we catch those up front. So we do those as part of the consolidation. Um, but I, that's a total, it is a concern. Once the consolidation is done, once the installation of all the facilities and, and uh, the Bracken Bray and Forest Springs get rebuilt, there'll be little staff time uh, to be spent up in there. And that's where, you know, the, the bi-monthly service charge and, and consumption come in to cover those costs. Um, it'll be a, a, a probably a break even because there's you know not a lot of connections and they're not they're not big users typically uh, they're they're in the redwood canopy and those customers use less water they don't have lawns they don't have uh, a lot of watering area there they use a lot less water up in the in the redwood canopies. Um, anything else, Jamie? Okay, I I just had. One question, um, Rick, in terms of like, who are we negotiating with? I, I think one of the things that all of the directors have sort of said is that there's a concern that um, you move ahead with negotiations right away um, regarding the consolidation, you know, even while we're waiting for the results of the decision on the proposal. And I guess my, my concern or my question is, is do we have, um, who are we negotiating with? What is the entity that we're negotiating with? And are we sure that that entity or those entities 
represent the will of um, the people that are are there. I guess what I'm concerned about is whether there's a potential for this to become uh, long and drawn out. I mean, obviously not the Lampico situation where we had to get LAFCO involved and it was, you know, because it wasn't in our sphere of influence, but whether this may become a larger political issue. So I, I guess what I'm trying to, to get a sense for is I, I want you to reassure me that, that everybody in uh, Forest Springs and Brackenbrae, they're all in on this, um, and that we're not going to have to do a, a big sell job. We're not. We're not there yet. There's a lot of questions in Brackenbrae and Forest Springs that will have to be answered uh, from their uh, from their folks. Um, but we're working on with the associations. Each of the the two mutuals have associations. We will be meeting with them, uh, district council and myself for the district. And they have, you know, they've already engaged and moved forward with engineering firms that are already doing the background work to rebuild their water system. They're very engaged and they're very hands-on. And they have a lot of questions. And, 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 and don't kid, I don't want to kid you or give you, mislead you. There will be probably a few folks in each one the old timers that will not want to uh, consolidate regardless of what. I mean, it's not going to be, I doubt it's going to be a hundred percent. Well, I, we don't expect that. <laughs> so, Gina, did you want to pipe in here? You're, you're muted, Gina. Thank you. I just wanted to echo what Rick was saying and provide a little additional color on, on the legal side. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, helpful that there are mutual water companies, which are legal entities with which we can negotiate and have an agreement um, in terms of how the process is going to unfold. Um, and in those initial um, discussions, one of the things we're going to want to do is see the bylaws of the mutual water companies to understand what the relationship is between the company and the members. Um, because it may be that the residents really have a voice in what the mutual water company does or doesn't do, or they may not. And that's something we'll need to understand in terms of how to document um, an MOU or similar agreement with these uh, with these folks as to how this process will move forward. Okay. Um, if if the board agrees, what I'd like to do now is is go out to the public because I, I have a sneaking hunch that the one hand up here is somebody from Brackenbrae that would like to address my comment. Um, so why don't we go ahead and let Nicole speak? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Nicole. Okay. Hi, I'm Nicole uh, Launderberridge and I'm a, um, a resident of Brackenbrae and I'm also the Brackenbrae Water Commissioner. And that's basically a volunteer position with a small stipend to oversee and act as a liaison to the state for our um, water system. Um, we uh, did um, have significant damage from the fire. We lost seven residents out of our 24 connections and we lost our treatment plant and we had just upgraded our storage um, for about 40,000 gallons of water storage. And we've been um, working with our uh, drinking water engineer in regards to the distribution line. So what we did back in October is we applied for public assistance through um, the FEMA entity and Cal OES, and we've been working very closely with them. We put in damages that are for $3.5 million with three permanent projects. And um, we've got um, all three of those projects have made it into estimating with FEMA. So we're waiting for the results of that to come out. But um, we have been in active discussion with our community throughout the whole recovery process because we didn't get water back um, into our community until December. Um, we've been taking informal polls um, throughout that process and narrowing down our water um, source options. And um, we just had a community, a special meeting of the community this past weekend. And the straw poll was to connect with SLV. Um, as a way to formalize that, um, favorable kind of pull, we are doing um, a secret ballot process because we're an HOA. Um, we use um, 
the civil code, California civil code to vote. And so we are asking our community to, um, through the recommendation of our board, to consolidate with SLV, knowing that the terms aren't defined, but this is basically to explore with SLV what it would take to do that connection. And then also with our FEMA dollars, um, the way that FEMA works is basically getting you back to your pre-fire condition with um, code upgrades and some hazard mitigation um, monies in there. Um, take that money and use an alternate um, procedures, um, 428, and redirect it towards this consolidation. Um, we have been involved with this. This has been like a full-time job um, within our community, and we are looking to upgrade all of our main lines. So one of the questions was, how much would be left to upgrade within Brack and Bray? Um, we have about 4,200 um, linear feet of main line from what we can tell from the way we've measured it. So the grant would cover about half of that, and um, we don't have a looping system. We're very familiar with how our system is. We can't say by inch by inch, but we have a very good sense of how our system is. Um, and we're asking for an upgrade from four inch PVC schedule 40 to six inch. Right now that's how FEMA is set up. Um, it is not for the eight inch. So we'd have to go through all that. We are also asking for an upgrade to recover what we lost in water storage, which would be the 40,000. Um, we did. We were able to put in 20,000 gallons. Um, and we're asking for money to replace our treatment plant that was burnt to the ground. Um, I have been the um, authorized by our community to represent our community, both with FEMA and for the phase two cleanup that we were included in. Um, um, the county on our behalf asked Cal OES for us to be a part of that process. We did go through that process. And in this um, upcoming vote, it would authorize me along with uh, key members and our FEMA team and our board to make decisions um, because with the alternate uh, process with FEMA, you have a 30 day window. So we are very eager to start these discussions and what the terms would be. Um, and we feel like we have a pretty good handle on what our system looks like and what potentially could come out of these FEMA grant dollars to basically round out the grant money that's being proposed through this resolution tonight, that we would come to um, a system that's very well intact um, if this consolidation came through. So I'm pretty confident with that. We are also worried about um, over cost runs. The one um, drawback from using an alternate process with FEMA is it's a fixed cost offer. So we're trying to negotiate our linear foot for mainline because currently they're well under what we believe the going linear rate is. So that's pretty quick and dirty. I don't know if anybody has questions for me, but um, I do feel like we're um, pretty well informed. We are a very active group and I do feel like Brackenbray as a whole is in favor of the consolidation and we will be voting and that vote will be opened up on the on November 6th. Well, thank you. Um, and we will know. I'm um, sure everybody's doing. Thank you so much for that really informative report. And I'm I'm very impressed. And if if you're one of the leaders of this whole thing, I'm feeling a whole heck of a lot better about it than I did 30 minutes ago. So keep up the good work. Um, did any of the other members of the board have anything they'd like to ask Nicole while we've got her here? Go ahead, Bob. Um Nicole, just to make sure I'm clear on what you were saying, if the grant came through and if you consolidated with um, San Lorenzo Valley Water District, your intention would be to use the FEMA money to complete upgrading of the rest of the system that is not covered by the grant. Is that correct? That's correct. We, we have asked FEMA to replace all 4,180 linear feet of our distribution line um, because we've had some hits with the VOCs. Um, and so, and with the amount of heavy vehicular traffic and equipment that has come through here, it has stressed out our system. So we've asked for that. And um, we want to have our water storage back in place. And so we've, you know, are working towards getting that 40,000. So that's part of our grant um, proposal with FEMA. And then we are we had money in there to replace the seven um, homes that we do have meters within Brackenbray. We don't charge for usage right now. Um, 
but we do have meters as a way to detect leaks. And we did that um, back in 2013. Um, so we have seven that need to be replaced. We do understand from talking from Rick that we would need to upgrade to the current standard for SLV for Wi-Fi, which we don't have. Well, I want to, thank you, um, Nicole. And I want to echo Gail's comments. I think um, it, it's very clear you, you understand this very well and are bringing a lot of uh, information to us. So thank you for, thank you for your interest in joining our district. And also just so it were, um, um, I'm not sure exactly about the spacing of fire hydrants. Our fire hydrants are um, the pier kind because we have a four inch um, diameter, but part of what we're asking FEMA to do is replace our fire hydrants to, because with the upgrade in the diameter of the pipe, it drives a, a different type of fire hydrant, which would be in line with what um, SLV would want. Okay, Jamie? I just wanted to thank you for um, <clears throat> coming so so well prepared to answer some of the questions that I'm sure you anticipated that we would have because um, you know I, I know that this is all going to have to happen <clears throat> rather quickly in terms of the discussions and negotiations that will go on between our staff and and, um, and your homeowners association. Um, so uh, thank you. That was really helpful, and um, I just again want to uh, echo the things that uh, Director Fultz and Director Mahood have said about how well prepared you came tonight. Thank you. Um, may I add something? Go ahead. Um, just a question about um, from your legal counsel there. Um, Brack and Bray was put together as a subdivision in the early 1900s, based off of being like a resort community. But um, as you know, Boulder Creek has gone through its many phases. Um, we are a um, community water system, which means that um, we have full-time residents that we provide water to. And basically our HOA has evolved over time. And um, the predominant need of business for our HOA is our water business. Um, so when you look at our um, decisions in regards to each annual meeting, it's all about how our fees are being spent to operate our system. So we're um, actively involved. There's no property manager. Um, it is the homeowners who are involved with a contracted operator of records. So we are very much in control of what's happening um, internally within Brack and Bray. So you'll be dealing with the people who make those decisions. And then just one last thing is that the vote that's happening in November is basically giving um, the authority to do this exploring and working out the terms. And it's also a sense of urgency for us because FEMA will need us to accept whatever terms we wanna do by February of 2022. And so we want to kind of really work through all this stuff because we will have to go back to our community to accept the terms of consolidation or to accept the terms in which we work with FEMA in order to, um, you know, move forward with the grant funding um, procedure. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Mark. Yes, Nicole, you mentioned uh, the vote that's coming up um, with your residents in November. Uh, given that, does that would that preclude you or um, others from Brack and Bray meeting with the district prior to that? Given what uh, Director Fultz and I were encouraging for uh, District Manager Rogers to begin discussions imminently. No, it would not preclude us from meeting. Um, our board okay. has already voted to um, move forward with exploring, but um, I felt very strongly that um, our community needed a way in in a um, formal manner. And because not everyone shows up to a board meeting, or not board meeting, but a community meeting, um, this right. was a formal way of notifying each member that they needed to vote on this matter. So um, the, our board has already voted in favor of the consolidation okay. and to explore it. So the it's not just a formality, but it's making sure everybody is on the same page in the community through this process. Okay, well, I, I applaud your going out to the residents uh, at this fairly preliminary stage then to get their take on it. Good. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Are there any other uh, comments or questions uh, from the public? Okay, seeing none, hearing none, um, I guess I would like to come back to uh, the board. Is, do we have 
um, a resolution in front of us um, authorizing the district to apply for grant funding in support of the proposed consolidation of Forest Springs and Brackenbury Mutuals into the district. Um, and so that's one thing that we need, a, uh, whether we need somebody to move that. I'm also wondering based on sort of some of the things that the directors have said, whether we also might want to have a motion that in addition to the resolution directed our district manager to begin negotiations with Brackenbrae and Forest Springs immediately regarding the consolidation while awaiting the outcome of the grant proposal and reporting back uh, to the board. It, that that was, I, I would like to move that. <laughs> what I just said <laughs> as a motion, if somebody wanted to second it. Well, so, I, does district council have a comment on that? Pardon? I was wondering if district council has a comment on the second resolution. Uh, well, I, I mean, that could be a motion or it could be a, a direction to the district manager. Um, but And the report back would the idea be at the next board meeting or by the first meeting in November? I, I would like a report back certainly by the first meeting in November. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'd, I'd prefer I'd prefer a vote on this one actually. Yeah, I I, I think there's not really I I, I yes. agree. I, I think just a, a formal motion to have it on on, on the record that, that we did this. Yes. I think so. Can can I restate it what I just said? And um which is that we direct the district manager to begin negotiations with Brackenbrae and um, Forest Springs immediately regarding consolidation while awaiting outcome of the grant proposal and report back to the board by the at the first board meeting in November. November 4. Okay, November 4. And I had seconded it, so I'll second it. Okay, and Bob seconded that. Um, so we have that motion on the table, um, and I probably should go out to the, well, we should get, um, comments by members of the board if they want to make any comments before I go out to the public about a motion. No? Any comments by, uh, members of the public? Seeing none, hearing none. Holly, can you take a roll call vote? President. President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Um, yes. Now we have the um, original recommendation to adopt um, the resolution. Would anybody like to make a motion about that? I can. Oh, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Lois, make, Lois no, wait, Lois, I, I asked Bob. Oh, you asked Bob. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, Gail, I'll let Lois if she, she would like to do that. <laughs> okay. I'll do the second. Are you for the second? Okay. I'd like to make a resolution uh, that the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District authorize the grant application acceptance and execution for the consolidation of Forest Springs and Bracken Bray Mutuals into the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And I'll second that. If, if I you. could just. Uh, can I just, the, that is actually not the motion that Gina recommended. And um, um, where is it? Well, well, it's just below that. Yeah, and I just want to be a little careful here. Um, yeah. You mean I said all that for? Well, yeah, I I think I I for, for example would not vote for what you just moved, Lois, because it implies acceptance, um, in and I think we're not quite there yet. Whereas the motion okay. that if you look just where down is, one paragraph, what so Gina? I, if I could make it just whereas one. What well, let let's Gina let Gina say what she wants to say. Okay. Yeah, to to boil it down, um, to sim to its simplest form, um, we just need a motion to adopt the attached resolution. <laughs> need a motion to it accept the attached resolution. 
Okay. Authorizing. I shall the make a motion that we accept the attached resolution. Is that what she just said? Bob, you should have done this. Yeah. That authorizes <laughs> that authorizes the district to apply for grant funding in support of the proposed consolidation. Yeah. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Bob. Um, any comment by members of the board? I'm sorry, I sound like I'm being really a nitpicker on this, but I, I just want to make it sure like we're, we know what we're voting for. Um, okay, if no comments by the board, let me just go out to the public and ask if they have any comments or questions on the motion. Seeing none, hearing none. Holly, would you like to take a roll call vote? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay. So now we will go, the, the motion passes, and we will now go on to uh, the second item of new business, which is the 2021 Capital Improvement Program Pipeline Project Design Award of Contract. Rick, go ahead. And uh, we do have a, re a recommendation for you. The district engineer will be, uh, should be uh, presenting this to the board. Josh. Thank you, Rick. Uh, on the table, first of three items this evening, we have uh, the design for our 2021 capital improvement plan pipeline project. We are recommending award of this project to Sandus Civil Engineers as outlined in my memo. For a bit of background, the project will include replacement of approximately 1.6 miles of pipeline and the Blue Ridge tank. We received four bids. Sandus was low by a fairly large margin. I'm happy to take any questions and have provided a proposed motion in the memo. Hey, uh, Mark, since you're the chair of the engineering committee, you wanna make any comments about this? Um, yes. Um, Santa submitted a complete and thorough proposal on this and they went uh, a bit beyond what we were asking for in terms of the information that they provided. Uh, they provided some preliminary uh, engineering aspects showing us that they've really thought about this. And after reviewing their proposal, I felt comfortable with it um, and concurred with Josh and Rick on the same. Okay. Um, any comments uh, from... Uh Members of the board, uh, Lois, did you want to make any comments or questions? <laughs> no. Thank you. Okay. Jamie. No, no questions. Hey, Bob. I did have a question and a comment. Um, did the engineering committee have an opportunity to review this or any of the items that were on the agenda? It wasn't, wasn't clear to me if that was the case. No. The engineering committee had not reviewed this given the timing of when the bids were available. We did not. Okay, great. Um, the comment I wanted to make is that I believe Sandus was uh, an organization that in a previous bid had perhaps gotten a little confused about what we were looking for. And I think at that time, um, at least I had made a comment that I, I hoped we would uh, give them some coaching and perhaps some guidance on uh, bids going forward because Sandus has done really good work for us, particularly in the CZU recovery process. And it really was important to me that they continue to be a um, part of our engineering uh, operations going forward. So I wanted to commend Josh for apparently for doing that because they came back with what is apparently a really good um, uh, proposal. Um, and for making this happen. Uh, and so I wanted to thank you and thank the Sandus engineers as well for, for doing such a good job on this. Thank you. Any other, any other comments or questions by the board before I go out to the public? 
Are there any comments or questions from the public? Seeing none, hearing none, um, would anybody like to make a motion? I will. Okay. Um, I'd like to motion that the board direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Santa Civil Engineers for development and plans and specifications for the 2021 um, CIP pipeline project in conformance with uh, Santa's proposal uh, dated uh, September 20th, 2021. Okay. Is there a second? A oh. second. Okay. Jamie seconded. Not me. All right. Uh, Holly, would you like to take a roll call vote? May Hood, has there been public comment on this item? I thought I went out. All right. But just in case I didn't, uh, any comments on this? Questions by members of the public? Seeing none, hearing none. Um, Holly, would you like to go ahead and do a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Lois, you're muted. <clears throat> yes. Director Ackerman? Yes. Director Fulce? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. The motion passes. With that, we'll go on to uh, the next item of new business, which is the 2021 uh, FEMA Pipeline Project Design Awarded Contract. Rick? Yes, we have uh, recommended uh, we award the 2021 FEMA Pipeline Contracts, and the district engineer will present this to the board. Josh? Thank you, Rick. This is the sister project to the previous item. This is for the portions of our system that we will be asking FEMA or have asked FEMA for help with repairs. It is a smaller project. It is approximately 2,200 linear feet of pipeline and a new booster station for the equity pressure zone. We received two bids, one from Freyer and Loretta, one from Sandus, both firms that done very good work for us. Sandus was low by approximately $90,000. Their bid is $171,000 and staff recommend that they be awarded this project. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Mark, as chair of the engineering committee, you want to go ahead and comment on this? Um, it's almost a repeat of what I was going to say on the previous one. Sandus okay. provided a uh, concise proposal on this, addressed what we were asking for, uh, did not provide uh, standard company boilerplate, which is what we've seen in some of their past proposals. They thought about it. Um, I agree with Rick and Josh's uh, recommendation that we proceed with Santa's on this one. Um, and again, given the timing, no, the engineering committee uh, did not uh, review this information. Okay. Are there any questions or comments by other members of the board? Bob? Uh, just one. Uh, is this 75% covered, um, Rick, by FEMA? We're not there yet. We're still getting cost estimating a project. We're just getting close to finishing up all of the damage. Um, review and then FEMA will be turning it over shortly to their estimators. Um, we have no idea yet what they're going to cover and what they are not going to cover. It's been but a long process. Understand, but we are asking that the engineering services be covered as well as- Yes. 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 Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, do I have any comments from members of, are there any other comments from members of the board? If not, let's go out to the public. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, hearing none, I'll come back to the board and ask if anyone would like to make a motion. I'll make the motion again. Go ahead, Mark. Certainly. Um, one of uh, the motion to direct the board to direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Sandus Civil Engineers for development of plans and specifications for the 2021 FEMA pipeline project 
in conformance with Sanjus Engineer's proposal in the amount of 171,000 with the proposal dated September 20th, 2021. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, Holly, would you like to take the roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fulce. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay, the motion passes. With that we go to our next item of new business, which is the Huckleberry Island Engineering Consultant contract. Rick? Correct. Um, uh, I will ask the district engineer to present uh, this item to the board. Thank you, Rick. This item is for award of a contract to MME civil and structural engineers for emergency work related to the main break on Huckleberry Island last month. In this case, rather than wait for board approval, we and MME go straight into making this, doing the design to make a permanent repair in this critical backbone. As a result, we are retroactively asking for the board to instruct the district manager to enter into a contract with MME. As a bit of background, MME was chosen for this based on their availability and proven track record of providing good quality service at reasonable prices to the district. With that, I will take any questions. Any questions for Josh? Another big reason we picked Sandus was that they are the original design engineers of the new Huckleberry Island Bridge uh, that we will be looking to hang the pipe on and have all the engineering records of that bridge. Mark, go ahead. So could I? Wait, I, I let because Mark's the chair of the engineering, let him start out, okay? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to point out to the rest of the board, if you're not aware of it, that uh, this uh, cost is just for a phase one conceptual plan for this piping. This is not the full design of the piping and the systems. Um, am I correct on that, Rick? I'm going to refer to Josh. On it. I thought it's ready to have plans and specs ready to go out to bid. It's that was my, uh, go back, then I may be incorrect in what I was reading, but this was only, I was reading it as a phase one. And I think we should quickly be able to look at that um, on page. 142. Yeah, page 142, 143 of the agenda. Correct. I would point out that on page 142, it includes phase one assessment items one through three. Item four of phase one shows on page 143, along with phase two design. Design, phase two design item one, pending completion of the assessment, we can prepare a more detailed work plan and cost estimate for the preferred alternative. The understanding um, then is that this project will go through conceptual alignment. I, Mark is correct on this. Director Small is correct. Okay. So there's a subsequent cost coming um, after they put this preliminary plan together. Um, we could competitively bid that, but there's another 70,000. 120,000, I'm guessing at numbers here, of design costs that we're going to incur for this piping. Yes? That is correct. Okay. There will be additional design cost. Okay. Um, so how long for MME to complete this phase one portion? We don't have a hard number on time. Yeah, uh, not sooner than later. 
Um, <laughs> um, this year? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, the expectation is that we would be doing this as on an as soon as possible basis. Mm -hmm. And my expectation is that since they have already scheduled survey for the 18th of this month, I would anticipate assume three to four weeks for completion of all the survey work and an additional six to eight for design work. I would hope that we would have their finished product through the end of their phase one assessment and conceptual design work in hand. This is the beginning of October. I would hope by that's first week in second week of December. Time okay. Frame. Okay. So before the end of the year. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Rick, have we had any preliminary discussions with property owners yet regarding uh, easements that were going to be necessary for this? Um, we, uh, District Council and I have met with the Homeowners Association uh, of Huckleberry Island to discuss um, easements, uh, in particular crossing the bridge. We're working on that. Um, we're also following uh, existing facilities and what we're really waiting for is the engineering uh, surveying work to come back to show existing easements, existing property lines, so we know, make sure we're, we're working with the right property owner. Um, so we need a little bit more information, then we'll be turning up uh, the effort to contact uh, uh, property owners. We don't yet have the exact route laid out. Um, I, I think they potholed uh, yesterday. I saw uh, an email from the director of operations that they have located the existing main in, in several locations. So we're getting closer. <clears throat> um, do we know who owns the bridge yet? I'm going to refer to district council. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we is that... a, uh, some documents from the homeowners association that they said that they would provide to us that uh, would help us um, make some determinations about who needs to be contacted for the necessary rights. We don't have that yet. Um, we can follow up with them. And you're not anticipating that we're, um, to one of your, the previous meetings, that we're not going to be able to cross that bridge, being not being able to use the bridge for pipe hanging then that we would be able to get easements i let me let me say it this way there's i don't know of any reason why the district can't get rights of way for that bridge okay okay good good okay that's all my questions thanks okay any other questions uh bob uh, yeah, and Mark, thank you for uh, bringing that up for the uh, for everybody. Um, that was the way I had read it as well. So, um, yeah. And on those lines, um, Josh, is it is it very clear to NME that the work product is the property of San Lorenzo Valley Water District in case we wish to use that to go out to bid for the next phase? Yes. Great. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from members of the board? Lois? You're muted, Lois. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm kind of concerned about how long is this whole process going to take? Because it seems to me, if by some magic, we get a lot of rain in January and February and March, uh, we could lose this whole thing. Or will there be able to be enough done, done by the end of the year to protect us? We're, we're moving in and to cut in the isolation valves just because of that, Lois, it's a great question because we're also concerned 
of the pipe, the, the temporary repair that we did to fail again if that embankment should slough further. So what we're gonna do after we get all the survey work done, we pick the route, then district force account staff will move in and cut in T's and isolation valves. So worst case scenario is all we would have to do is run the main and we would throw that you know right across the bridge, lay it on the bridge as an emergency uh, to, to get folks back in the water. So we, will, we do have a plan for that. Thank you. Okay. That's encouraging. Any other questions from the board? How about members uh, of the public? Any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, seeing none, let's come back to the board and see if anybody wants to make a motion regarding this. Mark. Unmute yourself. Mark, you're muted. No, unmute yourself, Mark. Thanks. Sorry for that delay. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we authorize uh, the district manager to issue a contract to MME engineers for Uh, for the amount of, sorry, I'm trying to pull up the motion. 44,000. 44,000 uh, for this pipeline uh, conceptual design as indicated in their proposal. I'll second that and make it a hat trick. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Any other questions or comments? If not, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. With that, we come to our last item of new business, which is the Springbrook Cloud Upgrade Contract. Rick? Yes, thank you. Uh, and this item will be presented to the board by the uh, Director of Finance. Kendra? You're muted or you can't hear you? No. No. We'll see how good Kendra is with pantomime. Well, she had it working earlier. I know. Just heard something. You got to unmute your phone. Nope. Oh, is she frozen? Yeah, she looks like it. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> it works. Okay, so um, a little bit of background. Back in 2015, uh, we upgraded our outdated DOS-based software system data stream to Springbrook, um, our utility billing software, which we are currently using, which includes our utility billing accounts table, accounts receivable, inventory control, purchase orders, fixed assets, cash receipts, clearinghouse, general ledger, and the work orders module. Uh, basically everything we need to, you know, do the day-to-day -day functions. Um, at the time that we did that, a cloud option was not that something that was available to us. Um, now that they have launched their new cloud-based software. Um, they offer uh, numerous benefits to us, and I'll just kind of highlight some of the main ones. Um, the main reason we should switch to the cloud uh, software is reduced cost in being that we wouldn't have to maintain a uh, server, and uh, which is like usually every three to five years, you have to upgrade a new server, which costs you know upwards of $40,000 and um, 
also the you know annual maintenance for the server and any backup support. Um, another benefit to the new cloud software is their Tableau reporting, um, which is included at no additional cost. And all of our current reporting tools that are on our premise software are kind of lacking. We have to pull a lot of raw data and manipulate it into like Excel spreadsheets, which is kind of how our current financial reports are going. Um, so the, the Tableau reporting definitely provides more ro a more robust like database reporting, um, which will hopefully allow us to, you know, really grow our financial report, um, uh, you know, over the years. Um, so it is recommended that the board of directors review this memo and approve the district to enter into a contract with Springbrook to upgrade to their cloud-based software. Okay, um, Bob, as chair of the admin committee, would you like to start? Um, sure. Uh, not speaking on behalf of the committee, though, I don't believe in this case, but I will definitely have some comments on it. Um, I think this is a very good thing. Um, I, as people know, I've been a um, fervent advocate of moving all of our infrastructure to the cloud as soon as possible. And not only for the uh, cost and operational benefits, but also for the cybersecurity benefits. To me, this is one of the key uh, elements of, of moving into the cloud. Um, small companies and agencies simply cannot keep up with the hackers and um, and all the other bad things that are happening in the, in the cyber world. And um, the security certifications that um, Springbrook has inherited and has on their own through Microsoft Azure are the kinds of things that we need to be looking for with all of the service providers that we ultimately uh, go with. Um, and, I, and I hope to see more of this going in, in the future. Um, and yes, Kendra Tableau is a, is a great tool. Um, a number of my clients use it. They're, they're, they're very happy with it. It really allows you to simplify your process, enrich the data, and make it a lot faster. So I'm hopeful that um, all of these things will make your team's life easier, uh, particularly as we start looking at new ways to look at our data uh, and usage and like, particularly by area um, and um, a number of other metrics that I, that I have in mind. So thank you for bringing this to the uh, to the table. And are, are they out of the public beta yet? I, I noticed that there might still be a beta announcement on it. Is is that sort of drawn to an end? Uh oh, we're still back to the mute. You can say down if it's they're out of the beta, <laughs> or up if they're out of the beta. Maybe it's better. I would have to ask the rep about that. I'm not sure what that what you mean by that. Oh well, they they had on their website that they were that the Cirrus cloud, which I'm assuming is what we're using, um, is open for public beta. That may be a uh, um, that may be a historical notice that I was looking at. So, but anyway, let's move um, on as quickly as possible. I'll make a note to ask our rep about that. Yeah, it's great stuff. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from members of the board? Jamie? Yeah, um, I'm just curious. Um, and, you know, I, I don't expect you to have a really great um, understanding of what the staff time will be in order to sort of invest in, in, in um, making the transition to um, the cloud-based version and what staff time you might need for um, any additional um, data manipulation that you, you know will be required in order to get the the best um, reporting out of the tools. But I'm hoping that we have the resources, you know, at some point in in the nearish term. And I know everything's a, a fire drill right now um, to focus on that because you know re reporting is uh, only good. It, you know, out is what you put in. And so I'm really eager to, to see some of this um, information be uh, more uh, readily searchable and available to us. Um, so thank you. This is great. Mark? 
Right. And I, 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 Sorry, did ask our, I did ask our rep about um, kind of what the whole migration would entail. And basically, um, all of the modules that we're used to using right now are pretty much similar. Um, the main training points would be on the new Tableau reporting. Um, but she said it, it, it's pretty much similar to what we're using now. So I don't anticipate there being a lot of staff time um, that is going to be needed for training purposes. It's just going to be for the reporting aspect of it. Okay, Mark? So Kendra, what do you anticipate then as far as the, the conversion time frame or the, the period? Of um, time? Yeah, so basically once we start once we sign the contract they it will take about three to four months for them to put us on the schedule um so i'm assuming early next year we could start um and as far as how long it's going to take them to uh actually like do the migration i'd have to check in with them on a time frame for that do we run concurrent systems at that point then um, on our server and operating through the cloud. Um, I, I don't want to say double bucks, but. Yes, um, I believe I, I, I can double check with them on that aspect. I'm, I'm not really sure, but I believe it, it, it can be concurrent just because we're using, it, it's basically the same uh, like, software that we're using now just going to the cloud. So there, there's gonna, I'm sure there's gonna be like some sort of delay in, you know, switching over the data, but um, that's something that the migration professional services that's included in the quote um, mm -hmm. that they'll be handling. Okay. Um, yeah. Why do we get discounts? Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> We, I, we I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in the initial um, contract, uh, so I, I, I can't speak to that, but... Um, Be, between I, the... I know that... Go ahead. Um, it, just a, and the following is just a comment. Between the discounts um, and the cover letter that looked to me like it was something that could have been written to Dear Occupant um, with uh, Dear Rick Roger, your agency and your citizens, and then the discounts, uh, seems like they should be doing a bit more professional of a job than the Dear Occupant letter that we got, but that's a comment. Okay. <laughs> Noted. Okay. I will let them know. <laughs> That's all the comments I have. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from members of the board? If not, let me go out to members of the public for any questions or comments. Seeing none, hearing none, I'll come back to the board. Is there anybody that would like to make a motion on this? I will move it. What are you moving? <laughs> Hold on. Okay, so let me make the motion that we approve, uh, instruct the district manager to enter into a contract with Springbrook to upgrade to their cloud-based software. That is brilliant, Dale. I will move <laughs> that language. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any comments or questions on the motion? All right, then Holly, would you like to take a roll call vote? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Foles? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Um, now we move to the consent agenda. Um, are there any uh, items that directors want to pull from the consent agenda? Um, if there's none, 
um, then uh, we don't have to vote on the consent agenda, right? So, okay. So then we can move on to district uh, reports. Are there any comments or questions on the committee reports? How about from members of the public? No? Woohoo! All right. Uh, then I think that if I don't hear any objections, we are ready to adjourn. Thank you all for an efficient meeting. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you everyone. Thanks. That was 817 adjournment. Thank you.